And those, uh, there it is. Is it? Now it is. Yeah. I, you know, I think I held it too long. Well, morning. Should be able to. Okay. I think we're. I think we're good to go. Okay. Good. It says R E C on the frame. Isn't that a good thing? Okay. Uh, so, first, uh, first thing first. Next Wednesday in the activity center. Uh, Highly recommend uh, a talk that's uh, that's that's uh, going to be given by Dr. Gary Bierman, who, like I've said before, has been here before, and it's about aging gracefully. But you do not have to be aged, whatever that means, to, to attend. So October twenty fifth. I'm sorry, September twenty fifth. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. September, oh, so September 25th, a week from today. Yeah. Sorry about that. Well, September 25th, 7 p.m. in the activity center. There are some flyers out on the table as reminders. Okay. Our next series here will start on October the 9th. And we'll be talking about the Minor Prophets. That's a Wednesday, the 9th, the 16th, and the 23rd. The Minor Prophets, and we will, uh, the first week we'll talk about the prophet Amos. And then the second week we'll talk about Zechariah. And then the third week we'll talk about Jonah and his quirky little book that is only, is only 48 verses. But it's uh, jam-packed with irony, satire, humor, and theology. And then on October the 30th, uh, Rory Pickert Niece from the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis and I will be talking together about um, Isaiah chapter 58 and she will address it in the context of the Yom Kippur fast. I will address it in the context of the Lenten fast and uh, and penance. Is that going to be here? You that will be there? over in the activity oh. center. Okay. okay. If you've that never heard Rory, <laughs> you're, you're, you've missed something. Yeah, she is just <coughs> wonderfully engaging and bright person. That's the evening only. That's the evening only. That'll be seven o'clock also. Seven o'clock. Okay. All right. So now. How appropriate for week three that we're talking about third Isaiah. It worked out perfectly. First Isaiah the first week, second Isaiah the second week, and now third Isaiah. So let's locate third Isaiah on our timeline. If you have your handy dandy timeline, there he is. If you don't, there are more copies of it up here. So first Isaiah uh, preached during the period roughly 742 to 701, okay? The uh, primary threat to the uh, Ju Judeans at that time were the Assyrians. Tigleth Pileser and Pileser and Shalmaneser and Sargon and Sennacherib, okay? Um, and there were two occasions when the Judeans were considering uh, were considering entering into alliances with foreign powers in order to protect themselves. And in both instances, first Isaiah said, "Don't do that. Trust in God. Adhere to the covenant promise that you made that you would not enter into military alliances with foreign powers." And of course his advice was ignored in both, uh, on both occasions, okay? And so in 701, that's the, the end of uh, first Isaiah's uh, preaching, Sennacherib comes and he attacks uh, Judea, or Judah, and he does everything except take over Jerusalem. And the reason why he doesn't take over Jerusalem is because Hezekiah pays him a huge ransom, okay? Uh, so that's that. Last week in 2nd Isaiah, we were dealing with, we were fast forwarding roughly 
65 or 70 years or so to the very end of the Babylonian exile. So Assyria pretty much controls Judah, and then Babylon in 586 defeats, or well before that, defeats the Assyrians, then they come and attack Judah, and they take over, and they carry the Judeans into exile in Babylon. Okay? And so that goes on for about 50 years until the Persians, everybody got their scorecard? Yeah. The Persians conquer the Babylonians, the Persians under King Cyrus uh, conquered the Babylonians and allowed the Judeans to go back home. So 2 Isaiah was about that period at the very end of the exile and the very beginning of their return to Judah. Okay? <clears throat> now, 3 Isaiah is after the return to, uh, to, to Judah and Jerusalem. I have the years 510 to 480 with a question mark because it's not very certain. One of the reasons why the timeline is not very certain for 3rd Isaiah is because he speaks so much in apocalyptic language. And apocalyptic language is vague about historical circumstances. Okay? So it's not clear. So what we see in 3rd Isaiah is uh, his reaction to the return uh, from Jerusalem, and he's also, uh, he expresses his disappointment both at uh, those who have returned and those who stayed behind. Those who stayed behind were doing some really inappropriate things in terms of the Jewish religion. Okay? And 3rd Isaiah has to point those things out. Alright? So he is writing from the perspective of Jerusalem uh, at, after the end, uh, roughly 25 years after the end of the Babylonian exile. So we've, we've moved forward. So you can see why the scholars say that 3rd Isaiah is neither 2nd Isaiah, although there are some who say that 3rd Isaiah really is 2nd Isaiah, who is disappointed at what has happened uh, after the return from exile. I don't buy that. I think it's a, it's a different guy, once again, because the literary style is different. The themes are different. Hey, Mark. Yeah. During the exile, you know, the Judeans, they were, you know, they were out. Was there anybody left in Judah? You know, was anybody minding the store there? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good question. And yes, there were people who stayed behind. The people, most of the people who stayed behind who were the people who were of little or no value to the Babylonians. So the Babylonians took the leadership so that they would have control over them. They took the, the people like uh, you know, artisans and you know, legal people and professional people because they would have value to the Babylonians. And as I think I've said before, uh, some of the Jews never went back to Judah after the exile. They stayed in Babylon. And there was a thriving Jewish community in Babylon for centuries after the exile. Okay? <clears throat> Life was good in Babylon, so they decided not to come back. All right. So when the returnees to Judah came back, they had, you know, expected this glorious restoration that 2nd Isaiah had, had talked about. But it was not so. They encountered uh, instead a lot of hardships. So the, the temple leadership was greedy. Fast forward 500 years to the temple leadership at the time of Jesus. Still greedy, right? Still looking out for themselves. There were, there were both inappropriate worship services taking place, and also this practice known as necromancy. Did I write that word on the notes? Right. Yes. Okay, what necromancy is um, an, an attempt to make contact with the dead, okay? To learn something from, from the dead. And, uh, you know, 
the, the, the Orthodox Jews, not the Orthodox as we know them today, but Orthodox Jews at that time <coughs> said, no, that's not, that's not appropriate to make contact with the dead. Okay. Um, the tone of Third Isaiah is one of frustration and melancholy. It's like, gee, this just didn't turn out the way that we thought it would. Yet, and this is so, now you know how characteristic this is of all three Isaiahs. There's this, ah, oh, gee whiz, you know. But at the same time, there's this, but it's going to get better, you know. The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar, they'll be, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the unusual Annie reference in the middle of a talk about Isaiah, but there it is. So, um, um, third Isaiah reflects a turning point between the tr tremendous optimism of second Isaiah and the pessimism of the Judeans after they returned home. Something else to know about third Isaiah is uh, it, it, it concludes an evolution in the attitude of the Isaiahs toward the foreign nations. So first Isaiah had talked about the foreign nations as manifestations of God's punishment. Right? You're not doing what God wants you to do so the Assyrians will punish you. Second Isaiah sees the foreign nations as God's instruments for purifying Israel. Israel had done something wrong, and now their time in exile is a time of purification. So it came to be seen not as so much as a negative thing, but as a necessary thing for uh, Judah to return to its appropriate religious roots. Okay? Third Isaiah actually... Uh, sees the foreign nations as coming to Jerusalem and as coming to the temple. So they continue the universalism of 2nd Isaiah, that message that not only is the God of Judah for the Judeans, but the God of Judah is for all the nations. He is the God of all the nations. And eventually, the other nations will come to see it. And they will come to Jerusalem to worship, and they will recognize Yahweh as the God of all the nations. That's pretty optimistic, right? That's, <laughs> that's very optimistic. That didn't happen, of course. Okay. So third Isaiah, in effect, is opening up the possibility that Judaism might become a world religion. Well, you might say that it is even today, but it's not. You know, it's, it's not as widely accepted as third Isaiah might lead you to believe. I think in the United States there are, what, 6 million Jews out of 300 million people? So not exactly, you know, uh, a, a mainstream religion. A strong one, but not a mainstream religion. Okay. Um, notice in 3rd Isaiah that the focus of religious life is very much post-exilic. So what do I mean by that? I mean that there is a focus on the temple, on worship and sacrifice at the temple, on fasting, on observance of the Sabbath, and on uh, observance of Torah. These were not uh, strong uh, uh, points of focus for pre-exilic Judaism, okay? They are very much uh, <coughs> manifestations of the evolution of Judaism, or I should say the remaking, the redefining of Judaism as a result of the exile, okay? So the exile forced Judah uh, and, and Israel to redefine itself, to redefine re the Judaism itself. And so what you see afterwards is a, a, a rather conservative form of, of Judaism. It is run by the priests. It is shaped by observance of Torah, 
by going to the temple, by the worship at the temple, by uh, 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 fasting, and, and Sabbath. Okay? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right. The book of Deuteronomy, which is really post-exilic, the whole book is a post-exilic retrojection, okay, is the book that was uh, written to say that what was going on in the aftermath of the exile was actually something that God revealed to Moses. So why would they do that? Well, if you want to give post-exilic Judaism credibility, put it into the you know into the time of Moses, right? Put it into one of the great the, the great times and great persons of Old Testament history. Okay, that makes sense. So Deuteronomy, even though it's you know Moses is in it, the stuff in it has nothing really nothing to do with the time of Moses. It has everything to do with post-exilic times. Okay. Um, one other thing, a little minor uh, thing, and this is one of the reasons why some scholars believe Second Isaiah and Third Isaiah are the are the same dude, is that neither one of them identifies himself by name in the book. First Isaiah, you know, uh, uh, addresses himself or writes in the first person. Second and Third Isaiah never mention their own names. Okay, and as we will see. Third Isaiah um, uses apocalyptic language, okay? And why do I why do I bring that up? Well, one of these days, maybe you know, we have about fifty topics that we can talk about. So I have that's job security. So uh, the reason why I bring up apocalyptic language is because the gospel writers put apocalyptic language into the mouth of Jesus. I mean, I say that, put it into the mouth of Jesus, because we don't know whether Jesus used that language or not. But the gospel writers say that he did. Okay? And so there's a, he's not inventing something new. He is merely picking up on a tradition that uh, goes back to the time of third Isaiah. So this apocalyptic language about, you know, the sun being darkened and, the, you know, the moon sh not shedding its light and earthquake and all that, the precursors of a new age or a new era, okay, when the page of history will literally be turned and there will be, to, to use third Isaiah's uh, uh, image, there will be a new world. Okay, and they don't say when exactly that's going to happen. Does all of that sound familiar? <laughs> the gospel writers say Jesus used that apocalyptic language to talk about the coming of the reign of God, the new age, the age of the end, the end of the age of Roman domination, and the beginning of the age of God's sovereignty, God's. Uh, domination, if you will, of, of Israel. The restoration of his sovereignty over Israel. A sovereignty that he had enjoyed during the time of the monarchy of David and Solomon and all the Jeroboam and the rest of them. Okay? Uh, a sovereignty that was lost at the time of the exile. So, we see in the apocalyptic language of 3rd Isaiah kind of the dawning of this use of apocalyptic language to talk about, you know, the, the beginning of a new age or the beginning of a new era in human history. Does that make sense? That's why I draw attention to the apocalyptic language. You, we see uh, a further evidence of apocalyptic language in people like Ezekiel. If you read Ezekiel, or if you read the prophet Daniel, okay, there's you, there's a lot of apocalyptic language in there. Okay, once again, uh, well, we don't know if it's factual, but it is true. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, Mark, but don't you don't isn't a thought about a popular bad I mean they're talking about an apocalypse now. Either people talk about 
populist or populist. Apocalypse, yeah. It, it, it's like it's the end of the world. Or, That's right. But isn't that what our well, concept of what an apocalypse would be? Yeah, like? the, the word apocalypse now, that's the name of a movie, but the, 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 in, in our time, the word apocalypse has negative connotations. That's what I call it. Yeah, of, of earthquake and cataclysm and all of that kind of stuff. In, in the time of Jesus especially, it meant more, these were signs, these were signs of the coming of the new age. Okay? In, in Nowadays, the apocalypse refers to the end of the physical world. It did not refer to that in the time of Jesus. It referred to a time of a new age in human history. Okay? So it changed, it, it changed description. Yeah, the word, the meaning of the word evolved. Okay, the meanings of words, a meaning, the meanings of a lot of words, evolve over time. Okay, right? There was a time when uh, cool meant it's not hot outside. <laughs> right? Oh, that cool. Yeah. There was a time when the word good, I mean, there was a time when the word bad, yeah, meant bad, <laughs> and then it meant good. So what did you think of that movie? That was bad, man. That means it was good. You see, so, you know, words, the meanings of words change over time. We could probably think of a hundred of them. Depending on who you're hanging out with. This time when day. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yes, it does matter. So let's take a look at the text, if there are no other questions. And we'll begin not with chapter 56, although 3rd Isaiah uh, is, is also found in chapters 56 through 66, but um, the scholars generally believe that chapters 24 through 27 are also 3rd Isaiah. And these four chapters are referred to as the apocalypse of 3rd, uh, yeah, the apocalypse of 3rd Isaiah. They were probably written after the time of 3rd Isaiah, but they reflect the theology and the thinking of 3rd Isaiah, okay? So, if, as we look at this, I would ask you to look at the, the New Age tone in these verses. Okay. Right away. Behold, the Lord will lay waste the earth and make it desolate. And he will twist its surface. surface that's probably an earthquake. Twi twisting the surface of the earth. And scatter its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people. So with the priest, as with the slave, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, so as with the lender, so with the borrower. How, how Jewish is that kind of, you know, all right, we get it, you know, as with the coach, so with the player, as with the cab driver, so with the, you know, the, the customer, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly laid waste and utterly despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. So, why is this, sounds like the literal end of the earth, why is this happening? It says it in, in I think it's verse 6, it's because of the sinfulness of the people. It's because of their failure to live up to the covenant. Okay? So there is there we go. No hope, all is bad. Keep reading. But that's the same thing we were just talking about a minute ago. Yeah, but I mean if, yeah. if that was what they were predicting apocalypse to mean, the earth is scorched, men are buried, da, da, da. Isn't that what we're talking about? Which we talked about that today. Yeah. So even back then, the, the term apocalypse had more than one meaning. For some, it was the literal end of the earth. 
Although you wonder whether that's really, you know, whether they're not using literary devices or whether they're really predicting the end of the world. Yes. I think what they're talking about is some kind of, uh, something bad's going to happen because of the sinfulness of the people. What you see here is 3rd Isaiah or somebody who's, you know, writing after 3rd Isaiah. It's a reflection of their disappointment. Uh, the, you know, the, the second Isaiah thought that when the people came back, everything would be hunky dory, and the people would, you know, turn back to Yahweh, and everything would be fine. And it didn't turn out that way. They continued in their sinfulness, and they continued to not live up to the covenant. Okay, but chapter twenty-five. O Lord, Thou art my God, I will like, exalt Thee. I will praise Thy name, for Thou hast done wonderful things, plans far of old. Faithful and sure. This sounds good. For thou hast made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. Uh-oh. The palace of aliens is a city no more, and it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify thee. Cities of ruthless nations will fear thee. Oh, so this has to do with uh, Judah's enemies. For thou hast been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the blast of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. Thou dost subdue the noise of the aliens as heat by the shade of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is still. Okay, so, verses 1 through 5. So, this is a celebration of the redemption of the righteous uh, you know, so we see God has delivered the poor, uh, those in distress, uh, a shelter from the storm, from the blast of the ruthless, they're, they're the enemies of, uh, uh, of Judah. Okay, This is typical of apocalyptic language. Oh my God, the world is about to end, but it'll get better after that. Okay, It's going to be okay. Then... Uh, this, these verses, I think, are should sound familiar. These are used in liturgy. These verses have to do with God holding a banquet to celebrate the redemption of the righteous. That banquet is something that would be looked back upon by, you know, Jesus and his followers. And it would become the messianic banquet, the great banquet in which everyone would be invited, right? When God's um, when, when when God's sovereignty was restored. So where do we see in the Gospels this kind of banquet? Well, in the feeding of the five thousand, in the feeding of the four thousand, in the at, at the Last Supper. Okay, so there are those those feeding narratives in the Gospels are reflections of, uh, of, of scriptures like this. Does that make sense? Um, one thing more about these verses. They uh, are kind of pickups or they allude to Canaanite mythology. Yes, the Judeans were in contact with the Canaanites. And so in Canaanite mythology, the storm god, whose name is Baal. Well, Baal, has, he does, he's more than just a storm god, but he is the storm god. He hosts a banquet to celebrate his defeat of the god of chaos. The sea god, whose name is Yam. Okay? Um, so, this defeat of the god of chaos is a typical creation story in the ancient Middle East. So in Genesis 1, um, God overcomes the, 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 the overcomes chaos uh, identified as Leviathan, the, the, the chaos that you see in uh, chapter 1 verse 2 of Genesis. So there, there's a reflection there of Canaanite uh, uh, mythology. but um, in Canaanite mythology, after this banquet, the forces of chaos are unleashed again, and Baal is killed. 
the Jews didn't pick up on that part of the story. All right? Uh, in, in, in these verses, chaos is utterly defeated. And God swallows up death forever. So here we go. On this mountain, Mount Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things. That sounds good. A feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. I don't know what the lees are, Lee. I've got <laughs> Can you help us? Oh, they're not tea leaves. That's right. <laughs> And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. He will swallow up chaos forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. See that vision of an unspecified future which is characteristic of apocalyptic, okay? This beautiful vision of, of God's future in some unknown, uh, unspecified future time. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him that He might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab shall be trodden down in his place, as straw is trodden down in a dung pit. And he will spread out his hands in the midst of it as a swimmer spreads his hands out to swim. The breaststroke, I guess. But the Lord will lay low his pride together with the skill of his hands, and the high fortifications of his walls he will bring down, lay low, and cast to the ground, even to the dust. A great uh, vision of God's victory over uh, Judah's enemies. Now this is what they're talking about at the temple. They're reading this out of... This, is this actually part of Torah? Or is this something... Yeah, this is part of the Torah. So um, they're being told this on Saturday. Yeah, they would, they would hear this in the synagogue. Okay. Yes. So it's good news now. This is good news. We're going back to Eden. Yeah, yeah, really. God is literally going to recreate the earth. Now, don't take that literally, right? Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> because you, you know the hazards of taking that literally. All right, so chapter 26. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's go fast forward to chapter 27. Now, this is an interesting verse, I think. Verse 1. In that day... And when you see the term that day or the day of the Lord, that's this time when God is going to uh, do something. Some of the, the, the some of the times when you hear that day or the day of the Lord, it's a positive thing like this. And other times, like in Amos, teaser for the next session, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Amos uses the term that day or the day of the Lord, it's a day of doom, a day of, of gloom, okay? Here it's not. So it can go either way. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent. Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Okay? So, um, I've talked about God's struggle with chaos or Leviathan before. Leviathan is not mentioned but alluded to in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We have been taught that God created everything out of nothing. That's because uh, over time, the Greek idea of creation superseded the Jewish idea of creation. Or I should say, the idea of creation contained actually in the book of Genesis. If you read the book of Genesis chapter 1 carefully, you will see that God does not create everything out of nothing. God creates order out of pre-existing chaos. Okay? And so, uh, then, then God struggles with chaos all the time. The classic example of God's struggle with chaos is the book of Job. 
So in uh, the last few chapters, 38, 39, and 40 of Job, God confronts Job and he says, um, he starts off with kind of a challenge. Where were you when I, you know, defeated, or when I created the earth? Where were you when I did this? And where were you when I did that? And then he starts talking at length about Leviathan, that Leviathan is this great sea monster. And what I gather from that, and what the people that I read gather from that, is that God is saying to Job, I continue to struggle with chaos. I struggle with chaos all the time. And sometimes I win, and sometimes I lose. And so that's why you're undergoing the suffering that you're, that you're going through. That's why you lost your children. That's why you got all this, these sores on your body. What you might say about chapter 1 of the book of Job, in which God makes a deal with the Satan, one of the sons of God. Well, if you, again, look closely at the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 41 are narratives. Chapters 3 through 40 are, are a poem. And uh, there are many scholars who believe that chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 41 uh, are kind of like bookends, that they were not part of the original story. That they were put into the story to give it a, you know, give it a happy ending and to set up why uh, Job was punished. And so Job, you know, I'm, I'm getting back to 3rd Isaiah, but, it, but uh, it, it, Job in chapters 1 and 2 is the one who says, you know, naked I came forth into the world and naked I will return, uh, you know, uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That's the patient Job that we are familiar with. Read again chapters 3 through 38. This is not a patient Job. This is an angry, bitter Job who wishes he had never been born, who questions God's moral character. He asks, is God so self-centered? Does God not see things from our perspective but only from his own? Well, <laughs> so God kind of sets him straight and says, you don't know who I am, and I'm not telling you who I am, but I will tell you that I struggle against Leviathan. I struggle with chaos. But this is the hopeful message. Now I'm bringing it back around to the third Isaiah. Ultimately, uh, God will slay the dragon. God will overcome chaos. And so the bad stuff that happens to people through nobody's fault will come to an end and God will be in complete charge of the world. Does that make sense? I, I have done a lot of thinking and reading about God and Leviathan. And uh, that, you know... This, this is where I'm at with it. Stay tuned. In a year, I might say something different. But that, that's where I'm at with it right now. So, um, in that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it, I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone harm it, I guard it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would settle out against them. I would burn them up together. Or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In the days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots. And the whole world with fruit. Now, I, that, let, let me take you back there to, um, I think it's the, 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 the fifth... Uh, yeah, um, the, the fifth chapter of Isaiah, when I think, when the, the first song of the vineyard, in the first song of the vineyard, God said He planted the vineyard, and that was that was Judah. And what did it yield? It yielded sour grapes. Okay, and and, and so the 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 Jewish people. Uh, they did not uh, live up to God's expectations. They, you know, they were planted by God 
but they didn't, you know, <coughs> it didn't turn out well. Now it does. Now it turns out fine, okay? A pleasant vineyard, you know, and, and so now, in that day, in that unknown future, the people will live up to their uh, promises to, to God, okay? They will be faithful. Does that make sense? As you can see, there's not... If you're looking for consistency, you know, throughout the scriptures, you're going to be frustrated, okay? Because it hops around, it, hops, it jumps around all over the place. Um, has he smitten them? Has he smote? Yeah. Well, all right. Well, we can. Let's see. Yeah. Let's just look at. What the heck? Chapter twenty-six. Oh, I skipped something. Chapter twenty-six, verses nineteen to twenty-one. Ah, okay. Yeah, this is this is worthy of comment. Thy dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for thy dew is a dew of light, and on the land of the shades thou wilt let it fall. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you, hide yourselves for a little while until the wrath is past. For behold, the Lord is coming forth out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will disclose the blood shed upon her, and will no more cover her slain. <clears throat> I want to call attention to 19. The dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. What does that mean? Is the, my question is, is this resurrection, is it real, or is it metaphorical? And is it personal? Or is it communal? Well, there are commentators who have said that this is a, an Old Testament affirmation of what we say in the Creed when we talk about the resurrection of the body. <coughs> but there are other scholars who say, who, who go with like, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 37 and Hosea chapter 6, they don't speak of resurrection as the physical resuscitation of bodies. They speak of resurrection as the resuscitation or the revival, revival or restoration of the nation of Israel. So they view resurrection in national terms, metaphorical terms, okay? And resurrection at the time of Jesus, and that's why I bring this up, resurrection at the time of Jesus was understood the same way as the revival, the restoration of the nation of Israel, not as the physical resuscitation of bodies. And so in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse, verse 54, I believe, 52 to 54, when Jesus dies, what, what happens? There are, body, there are people who come out of the tombs and they walked around Jerusalem on the day when Christ arose. So in other words, Matthew is, is saying that not only did Jesus rise, but the nation rose on that day. Okay? Now, as we know, over time, the interpretation of Jesus' resurrection and Matthew and all that can be understood as the physical resuscitation of his body. Okay, the empty tomb, and uh, and that 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 he was the precursor, the the firstborn of the dead, so to speak. That what Jesus did by walking out of the tomb is what we will all do, at the end of time. Okay. Boy, if you were living in these days and going to the the temple, you were. You have one guy yelling something one week and one guy yelling something the next week. Oh, you need a good rabbi. Well, it depends on what rabbi you hear. Lee, to this day, wait, wait till you hear Rory. I mean, she will say that the whole uh, Jewish, at least orthodox, approach to Scripture is about argumentation. She says she's always kind of... Um, you know, thrown off a little bit when she's in front of Catholic audiences because they don't start disagreeing with her. When she's, you know, when she's talking to her fellow Jews, they're like, no, it doesn't mean that, it means this. Because Rabbi so-and-so said this, and this Rabbi said that. The, the scriptures for the Jews, the best way I can describe the difference in their approach to, as opposed to ours, 
is, and, and Rory and I have talked about this, I've said that we Catholics are looking to find the right answers when we look at Scripture. What does it mean? What is it saying? And the Jews are trying to ask the right questions. And so, you know, they believe in this tremendous richness of the Word of God. It's just, you know, there's all, it can mean all kinds of things. So, you know, when, when it says, here's a real simple example. When it says, don't, you, you uh, may do no work on the Sabbath. What does that mean? Well, um, in Jesus' time, it meant you can't pull your donkey out of the, out of the pit. Right? Or you can't pull the husks off of the, of the corn. But Jesus did pull the husks off of the corn, right? So there were other rabbis who said, no, that's okay. And, and, and if you, I, I know you've probably read the, the Talmud, but if you read the Talmud, yeah, yeah. If you read the Talmud and the Midrashim and all that, you'll see that there are just many, many uh, interpretations of the scriptures for the Jewish people. You know, we're, we're good Westerners. We'd like, well, tell me the answer. I want to know the answer. I want to know what it is. Well, it's not always that clear. Well, yes. Google it. <laughs> Google <laughs> That's what Wikipedia is for, right? Yeah. yeah. If you want to find the answer. Okay. Um, chapter 27. Yes, I have one more. <clears throat> yeah, verse 9b. Sorry for hopping around like this. Therefore, by this guilt of Jacob, therefore by this, the guilt of Jacob will be expiated. And this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin, when he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces. No asherim, or incense altars, will remain standing. What are we talking about there? Well, there's no... There, you know, in, in some of the translation, it says uh, there, th th there should be uh, no, more, no more poles, no sacred poles or incense altars, okay? So the sacred poles were uh, erected for Asherah, A-S-H-E-R-A-H, who apparently was the female counterpart of Yahweh. Okay, and there is a lot, lot, lot of evidence about God, Yahweh, having his female counterpart, Asherah. Now here, uh, Third Isaiah is saying, take down, you know, take down those sacred poles, and don't burn incense at those altars of Asherah. In other words, worship only Yahweh. Okay, that is the part of the Deuteronomic uh, influence on Judaism. They wanted to, to stifle this belief in the in in Asherah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, Asherah is worth is worth worth spending a little time. All of this is before the Ten Commandments, is that it? No. Well, wait a minute. In the first Ten Commandments, it said thou shalt not worship. Any God. Yeah, but uh, how often did they keep that? <laughs> That's what it says. But, you know, according to the book of Exodus, within not very long, Moses went back up on the mountain and they, they made a, 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 a molten calf. I can't see what Moses So in other words, they, you know, just because, it was, just because it was the Torah, Lee, not everyone is as good as you. <laughs> not everyone. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. In all humility, right? Yeah. So that you know, so so those laws were broken yeah, repeatedly. Your question is one I'm not going to go into. There's a deeper answer as to when exactly the Ten Commandments were put into the Book of Exodus. Okay because they are reflections of a much later time in, in Israel's history. We're not going there today. Okay. We're ready. <laughs> not going to go there. All right, so now let's fast forward a long way. Now let's get into chapter 56 through 66. 39. 
says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. There's that word again. You know, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Isaiah all insist on God's justice. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Um, what is this? Quiz, pop quiz, what is this? Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast. It's a beatitude. All right, yeah, perfect. That's a beatitude. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus, for thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Well, good for them. I will give them an everlasting name which shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, every one who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Hear anything there? My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it into a den of thieves. Oh, yeah. So, okay? All right. That's, these are the words that the gospel writers have Jesus speak when he is cleansing the temple. Okay? Yeah. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. So can you see how 3rd Isaiah is talking about how God will become uh, the God not just of the Judeans but of other peoples as well. So, um, um, yeah, like the... Uh, the, the, the eunuchs, uh, the, these are the eunuchs are, are unacceptable uh, people. Okay, and but he's saying no, no, they'll, they'll be with me. Um, the foreigner, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me. Okay, no, they will be part of God's people as well. This is part of that optimistic vision of the future in in Third Isaiah. Notice what else it calls for. Um, Sabbath, covenant, holocaust, sacrifice, these are all elements of Judaism after the exile. Okay, This is the direction that Judaism took after the exile. Uh, verse 5. This, this verse doesn't say it very well, but I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which shall not be cut off. So I just wanted to note in my reading uh, at the Israeli Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, its name is Yad Vashem, and that's taken from this verse. And Yad, Yad Vashem is taken, you know, it literally means a monument and a name. I don't know if, you're, if you're, your Bibles have that. But the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem is, is named, its name is taken from this very verse. So, okay. Uh, yeah, verses 9 through 12. All you beasts of the field, come to devour. All you beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are dumb dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. 
The shepherds also have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own game, one and all. Come, they say, let us get wine, let us fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow we'll be like this day, great beyond measure. That's what they all say when they drink too much, right? <laughs> so, uh, third Isaiah is saying here that the leaders of post-exilic uh, Israel uh, are, are corrupt. And so God is summoning the wild dogs to consume or to devour Israel's corrupt leaders because they're lazy and, and gluttonous drunkards. Okay? This is an expression of that disappointment that Third Isaiah had uh, after the return of the uh, folks from exile. They thought, you know, Second Isaiah has this great, you know, optimistic vision, and it just didn't work out that way. Just did not turn out that way at all. Okay. Oh yeah. Still chapter fifty-seven. Yeah, three to thirteen. So these are some of the things that the folks did who stayed behind. This is a description of some of the practices that were engaged in by those folks who did not go into exile. All right? They stayed behind in Judah. But you, drawn near hither, sons of the sorceress, uh-oh, offspring of the adulterer and the harlot, is not good. Of whom are you making sport? Against whom do you open your mouth wide and put out your tongue? Are you not children of transgression? the offspring of deceit, you who burn with lust among the oaks. Okay, burning with lust, lust among the oaks is a reference to a uh, fertility service that involved sexual activity um, among the oaks, okay? It was an attempt to uh, appease uh, uh, Yahweh, who was, you know, among other things, a, a fertility god, okay? So, but this was not the way to do it. <laughs> you know, having sex among the oak trees was not the appropriate way to honor the God of fertility. Why do I call Yahweh a God of fertility? What, what were the promises that he made in the, the covenant? To give them land, to always be with them, to uh, promise them a progeny. They would, they, would, they would be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Well, that's fertility. And he promised them that their, their crops would be fertile. So he was the God, among other things, of the fertility of their women and the fertility of their crops. Yahweh was a fertility God. And so they are, they are doing what they think is the right thing to do to you know, uh, invoke uh, the, the Yahweh, the fertility God. Third Isaiah is saying, no, that's not the right way to do it. Okay? Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. They, they are your lot. To them you have poured out a drink offering, you have brought a cereal offering. That's another, um, this is another uh, 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 ritual that Third Isaiah is saying is inappropriate. Bringing them a drink offering or a cereal offering. Who are these smooth stones? Hang on. Oh, the, oh the, the smooth stones refers to the dead. And so this is one of those rituals of necromancy that, that the uh, people who were left behind were practicing, okay? Offering uh, drink uh, and, and cereal to the dead, okay? Shall I be appeased for these things? Upon a high and lofty mountain you have set your bed, and thither you went up to offer sacrifice. Behind the door and the doorpost you have set up your symbol for deserting me. You have uncovered your bed and gone up to it. You have made it wide. You have made a bargain for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. In other words, you have been an adulterer. You have not been faithful to your God. Okay, that's a form of adultery. You journeyed to Molech with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far out far off and sent down even to Sheol. This word Molech uh, and, and oil is, uh, uh, is significant. You would never, I would never have seen it before I started reading about this. Molech can also be translated as Mulk, M-U-L-K. And M-U-L-K refers to a child offered in sacrifice, human sacrifice. Hmm. 
Okay. So what about the oil? Well, apparently these children were being anointed with oil before they were burned. So one of the, another one of the inappropriate practices that 3rd Isaiah is condemning is child sacrifice. Okay? Uh, the, you know, look, look back to the uh, Abraham story with Isaac. So what is that but a prohibition against child sacrifice? Right? They had seen child sacrifice during the exile. And they, they found it abhorrent. Although there is evidence of that there was child sacrifice prior to the exile. Um, I'll get to that. And then verses 11 to 13. Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me? did not give me a thought. Have I not held my peace even for a long time? And so you do not fear me. I will tell of your righteousness and your doings, but they will not help you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. Okay? Another one of their inappropriate practices. Yeah, go ahead. Let's see what your idols can do for you. Have at it, right? Go for it. The wind will carry them off. A breath will take them away. But he who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So you can see there a condemnation of, of a, a number of inappropriate practices on the part of those who stayed behind. All right, chapter 58. I'll go into this just a little bit because this is what Rory and I are going to be talking about. Uh, Mark? <clears throat> yes? Um, the smooth stones, um, does that have any relevance to the fact that on Jewish... You know, it might. I never thought of that, Pat. But it, you know, I'd have to look that up. But that does make sense, doesn't it? You know, the placing of a smooth stone on the grave of, of, of the dead. That does, yeah. That, that very poignant scene at the end of Schindler's List when they're all placing the, the stone on Oscar Schindler's uh, grave. I don't know. Yeah, you know. Well, they're not communicating with them, though. They're just a remembrance. Yeah. We're here to remember you. Yeah, but then you know the the, the custom of placing the stone might be uh, ambivalent. It might mean more than one thing. So if you put yeah. the stone on there, that that might be okay. But trying to communicate with right. Oscar, not okay. No. Yeah. Is that why they don't they have a thing about they have to bury them before the? Yeah, yeah. within 24 hours, yeah. But they don't um, embalm their dead either. Right, right. You know, yeah. some of that is, oh, there's religious reasons and also hygienic reasons. Muslims do the same thing. Yes. You know, Muslims bury their dead within 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's 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 what, what is the essence behind it? Of the disease? Or? Well, yeah, I... There are religious reasons that escape me at the moment, but there are also hygienic reasons because the body can begin to decay pretty quickly, and they don't embalm either. Neither religion embalms. That was a concern after 9/11 because there was there were no bodies to bury. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That was a big uproar yeah. about that. Now, what, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, some of those bodies were just inc incinerated. You know, like the, the jets were in, in, were just incinerated. Nothing left. Nothing at all. Um, okay, so, verses 1 through 14. This, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll read some of this. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sin. This is God speaking to third Isaiah. Yet they seek me daily and delight, and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to, to God. Why have we fasted and thou seest it not? Why did, this is now the people, uh, you know, the people of, of Judah speaking to God. Why have we fasted and thou seest it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and thou takest no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek, and this is God answering them, 
Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with wicked fists. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a rush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Well, normally we do, don't we? We're like, yeah, we do. Is not this fast the fast that I choose? This is the key. Is not this fast, is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? So here, God, through third Isaiah, is saying, you know, these, these ascetical practices of yours. And keep in mind that the fast became an important thing uh, uh, after the exile. So there was the fast during the fifth month, there was the fast during the seventh month. The fast during the seventh month is what evolved into the fast, the 25 hour fast uh, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And Rory has told me that these verses are read in the middle of their 25 hour fast on Yom Kippur. And so she will hear comments like, what the heck are we doing then? Yeah. You know, so what, what Third Isaiah is saying, what God is saying through Third Isaiah is this: your 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 fast, your abstinence, your doing whatever is only uh, worthwhile if you do the work of justice as well. And notice here, uh, you know, and again, that, that is one of those key themes in all of Isaiah. And if you fast forward now to the 25th chapter of Matthew, verses 31 to 46, when it says, and the judge shall come upon the clouds and they'll divide the sheep from the goats and all that, and, and he will say to the sheep, when I was hungry, you fed me, you know, come into my kingdom. When I was hungry, you fed me, and when I was thirsty, you gave me drink, and when I was naked, you clothed me. And, and those on his right say to him, when did we see you hungry, naked, thirsty? You know, and, and, uh, and he says, as, as often as you did it to one of my least brethren, you did it to me. That's, a, that's an echo from these verses, right? So Matthew is saying that the standard of judgment, the standard of the judgment of our lives is how we treat the poor and the, the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the prisoner and, and the person who is sick. And that the, this, this, these verses say exactly the same thing. So a little bit about fasting in the history of Israel, okay? Fasting was done for uh, a number of reasons. First of all, it was done uh, uh, as, as, a, as a sign of, of uh, bereavement or, or grieving. So if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, David mourns the death of Saul and Jonathan by fasting. Um, it was also, uh, uh, fasting was also uh, uh, done at times of national tragedy. So in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, verse 6, Joshua defeats, uh, laments the defeat of the Israelites at Ai, Ai. He fasts in order to show his grief, or his, uh, his sorrow. In the book of Judges, chapter 20, verse 26, um, the, the, the Israelites fast after, after they have been defeated by the Benjaminites. After the exile, times of fasting in Judaism increased. So in the book of Zechariah, which we'll be looking at soon, it extended to the fifth and the seventh months. 
And then if you look in, in Leviticus chapter 16, um, there was one great day of fasting on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Okay? Um, so, if you look at verses 1 through 7, again, I won't read them again. There are two words that, uh, uh, th that stand out. The first one is desire. The second one is affliction. And uh, third Isaiah uses both the words desire and affliction in two ways. So the word desire, it expresses both Israel's desire for externalism, you know, formalism, fasting, external rituals, Versus, that's their desire. Their desire is to fast. What is God's desire? To take care of the poor. Okay? So, the desire of the Judeans is contrasted with the desire of God. The second word is affliction. So, the contrast there is between the people's self-affliction through uh, fasting versus their neglect of those who are afflicted, the poor, who are right among them. Rather than you know, afflicting themselves with fast and afflicting their, their peers with poverty, they should be taking care of the affliction of the poor. That's, that is such a strong, you know that by now, that's such a strong message in Isaiah and, and in the prophets in general. Okay? All right. That's a, you know, very, very, powerful, uh, very powerful verses there. Um, okay. Keep moving, Mark. So chapter 59, verses 1 through 3. The Lord, see, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. So... Uh, you know, here, it, it, uh, th this is the complaint of the people. Lord, your hands are too short to save us. You're not doing what we need. You're not doing what we want. You're not listening to us. And God's response is, uh, it's not my fault. It's your fault. It's because of what you are doing or not doing. That's why I'm not stretching out my hand to save you. That's why I'm not listening to you. Because you're being sinful. This is your problem. This is not my problem. Okay? Uh, I'm just going to make a comment about this. If you, if you have the time to read oops, verses 9 through 15. Uh, Justice is far from us. Righteousness does not overtake us. We look for light. Behold darkness and for brightness. But we walk in gloom. Truth is lacking. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. So here, the community wants justice and righteousness, um, but they, at the same time, they know that it's their own sins that keep justice and righteousness from happening. But when, if you, if, when you read these verses uh, more closely, and I'm not going to for the sake of time, notice that the, the people... The Judeans express no remorse for, for their sins and no intention to change their ways. They're just saying, yeah, we're sinners, you know, oh, I'm a bad person. But they're not saying they're going to do anything about it, okay? They're not saying anything about the firm desire of amendment as is part of, you know, the, uh, the catechism about confession, right? One thing to confess, it's another thing to, like, you know, kind of change and, 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 and do things differently. It, there, there's none of that here. Bless you. 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 Bless you.
mistake. And yet, as soon as we go to chapter 60, there's always a good message around the corner. So when you read about doom and gloom, keep reading. All right? Um, chapters 60 through 62 talk about, once again, the glorious restoration of Israel. And these chapters are very close in tone to 2 uh, Isaiah. Okay? The difference is that when 2 Isaiah talks about the restoration of Israel, uh, he puts it in the context of their uh, deliverance by Cyrus of Persia. 3rd Isaiah does not. His day of deliverance or, you know, his time of restoration is in an unspecified future, as I've said before. Okay? Chapter 60, verses 2 and 3. Well, let's start with chapter four, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This is that, yeah, that is from Messiah. That's from Hamel's Messiah. Um, so... This is that statement of future universalism when not, that when God will be acknowledged just not only as the God of Israel, but also as the God of the other nations. Other nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Uh-oh. Yeah. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. Christmas, Christmas time story. They, will, they shall bring gold and frankincense. That's why you hear this one in Christmas time. And shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Is it possible that Matthew, reflecting back on these verses, thought, ah, we'll have, uh, you know, we will have uh, astrologers from the east come and pay homage to, to the baby, bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Uh, All the flocks of Kadar shall be gathered to you, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you, they shall come up with acceptance on my altar, I will glorify my glorious house. Okay. So, the nations not only will show up in person, but they will bring their wealth to this new, redeemed, glorious Israel. Alright? Um, let's see. Oh yeah, verse 16. This is an odd verse. So it needs a little bit of explanation. It's just kind of, on first reading you go, what? You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall suck the breast of kings. What? And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior your, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Well, that sounds really odd, except <laughs> that in ancient Middle Eastern mythology, great kings, it's, it's written about uh, from time to time, that great, great kings were breastfed by goddesses. Okay? And so here, what Third Isaiah is saying is that Jerusalem will be breastfed by the nations, okay? That, yeah, that, that, that the nations will acknowledge Jerusalem, okay? Uh, let's see, should I do this one or not? No, we're going to skip that one. Oh, just these verses here, verses 17 through 22, chapter 60 you will see these reflected in the book of, of Revelation, which is another apocalyptic type of book. If you look in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation, you will see you know, these verses um, reflected. Ah, see if these verses aren't familiar. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, 
and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Where, who, who, who said those words? Jesus. Jesus. And when did he say them? In the when temple. he was reading in the temple. Uh, close. He was in the synagogue at Nazareth in the fourth chapter of Luke. Okay, he goes home to his own, his own synagogue and they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he opens it to this verse. Okay, so that's the main reason why I bring that up. But notice again, what is the, what is the standard? Okay, the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison. So, you know, in Luke... Jesus' announcement of his commissioning is an announcement of working for God's justice. Okay? In other words, that's what he was sent here to do. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He's saying that, yeah. That is uh, Luke's kind of, you know, way of announcing Jesus' mission. Okay? And this is shortly after his, his own baptism by John. Okay? Um, let's see. Let's go to chapter 63 for a second. I'm running out of time. Why? Because Mark talks too much. <laughs> so here we are picking on Edom yet again. How often in Isaiah have we, you know, have we beaten up on the country of Edom, which is down below here, down in, down to the down to the south, down that way? Who is this that comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bozrah, a city of Edom? He that is glorious in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I announcing vindication, mighty to say, Why is thy apparel red? and thy garments like his that treads in the winepress. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, isn't it? A little bit of a, a reflection there, right? Their lifeblood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. And my year of redemption has come. <coughs> Holy cow. So, this is God. You know, who, who is that coming from, from Edom? It is I announcing vindication. Why are your robes red? God has trampled the wine presses of Edom and crushed them, the people, in his wrath. Okay? Why is Edom so often singled out and, uh, you know, uh, uh, blasted like this? Well, because um, the Israelites believed that, and I've said this last week, that when the Babylonians uh, conquered them and took them into exile in 586, that the Edomites, you know, uh, kind of piled on and joined with the Babylonians in, in oppressing and beating up the Israelites as they marched into uh, exile. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, chapter 64. I want to make sure I get to the very last verse in 3rd Isaiah. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at thy presence, as when fire kindles the brushwood and the fire causes water uh, to boil. The Israelites want God to come down, to tear open the heavens, <clears throat> literally tear open the heavens, rip through the, the sky in an awesome display of, of power. That's what they're asking for. Verse 8. This is a familiar verse. Two and I just lost it. Yet, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay, 
and you are the potter, right? We are all the work of thy hand. That's, a, that's another one of those familiar, I don't know where we see it, whether it's on a holy card or, you know, wherever, but uh, it, it, it's a beautiful verse describing God as the potter who shapes and molds um, his people. Um, chapter 65. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. Okay? I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that did not call, my, call on my name. This is God speaking. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face <laughs> continually, sacrificing in gardens and burning incense upon bricks. Once again, those inappropriate uh, uh, rituals that the people left behind were engaging in, who sit in twos and spend the night in secret places, trying to communicate with the dead, okay? Who eat swine's flesh, uh-oh, don't do that, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, okay? So by this time, you know, uh, the, the prohibition against the eating of, of, of pork was, uh, was in place. I, I believe that uh, you know a lot of these kind of prohibitions stemmed first of all from from hygiene. They found out that you know if you if you ate pork, if you ate pig, it would make you sick and it might kill you. So don't do it. And not only that, but God doesn't want you to do it either. <laughs> so here we go. All right. So some negative stuff, so naturally, it should be, and it is, balanced by this. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. So the restoration is uh, a second creation of the world. We've had, we've had restoration described as a second exodus, and, not, and also as a second creation of the world. And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Uh, verse 20. No, no more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So... Long life in, in at this time is still is a blessing from God. Okay, so Adam lives nine hundred and thirty years, just to say he is he is a good guy. You must be a good man, Lee. Wow, I see. That's another crazy way. That's, man, that, 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 that is just not right. Hey, if you got it, hang on to it. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> I I don't know about you, but I like having birthdays. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So they're not going to build houses to have somebody else live in them. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and the children with them. Before they call, I will. Before they call, I will answer. But remember, before it was, "Hey, God, where are you? You know, you're deaf and your hand, your arms are too short." Well, before they call, I will answer. I will be with them. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The new Eden. Right? A return to the Garden of Eden. There's a place in Branson that has the, the lion and the lamb lying together there. I, I, yeah. I think it's by the Sight and Sound Theater yeah, there. Right oh, okay. It's kind of, uh, kind of unique yeah. takeoff on that. It's right, yeah. It's yeah. A, a, in the body of this. So let's just jump since it is 11 o'clock. 
to the to, to the last verse. It's it's a little bit troubling. So there's here. I'll explain some of the other stuff. Yeah, I was going to talk about the whole the whole <coughs> chapter. Um, so in chapter 60, 66, the last chapter in Isaiah, there is another oracle of judgment. So this this is negative again. And there is, in verses 1 through 4, a condemnation of temple sacrifice, yet again. Um, there, in verses 7 through 13, there is a reference to Mother Zion. Mother Zion, who will give birth to a new Israel. Okay? Uh, verses 17 to 24, I recommend them, you know, for your, for your reading. This is really a summary of 3rd Isaiah. This is a summary of all of 3rd Isaiah. There's a condemnation of inappropriate worship. Verse 17. The gathering of the nations. Verses 18 through 20. The new heavens and the new earth. Verses 21 to 23. And then, this is the conclusion of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And they shall go forth and look on the dead bodies of the men that have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Wow. So, in other words, all the people will go out to Gehenna. Yeah. Why? To witness the burning of the corpses of those who have rebelled against God. Pretty gruesome. Okay, so that, yeah. this is the word of the Lord, right? So, <laughs> so that's the way the, uh, the book of Isaiah ends. Is that, Any, is that metaphor? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, this is one of those, uh, 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 you know, hyperbole or, or embellishments, you know. You, you, you have no doubt about what the author is trying to say here, right? right? We'll win, our enemies will lose. No doubt, right? Any la last observations or I hope this I hope you found this uh, helpful. Did you see that the book of Isaiah is a rather complex work and there's a lot of layers and there's a lot of history behind it. So I think, I think that's the major thing. A lot of this happened. All this happened, and I take it that we know about this because of the world, other things they may have found. Yeah, even and, though they were written a long time after. And there's just been a lot of research into these texts. Lee. There's been a lot of research, archaeology and history and commentary and all that kind of stuff. But it's hard to get them resolved between. Like, like you say, it's back and forth, so you really don't know whether this was happening before Moses or Moses. Yeah, or now, so. and in a way it doesn't really matter, because what we're looking for are those themes that keep coming up. One of the themes that keeps coming up is take care of the poor of the widow. If you want God to be with us, this is what God wants. He wants social justice. He wants, you know... Uh, justice for the poor, the widows, and the orphans. Thank you once again for coming. I appreciate it. Turn it off. We can turn it off, Bob. <laughs> and we will uh, we'll, we'll resume October the 9th, okay?